Hey everyone, Sarah Peck here, and this is the Startup Pregnant Podcast. Today we are going to talk about decision making and decision analysis and how it can be so challenging to make decisions. Our guest today is trained with a background in engineering. She studied decision engineering at Stanford. Then she worked in brand management for quite a while, went on to get her MBA at Berkeley, and is today a decision analysis expert and a coach for type A professionals. Our guest is Michelle Florendo, and she talks to us both about her career path and about how motherhood fit into it and why decision making got harder as a mother, but her skills and tools as a decision analysis expert helped her make really great decisions. She was working on three different gigs when she found out she was pregnant with her first child. She had her career coaching practices. She was working with coaches in the second sessions of the Alt MBA with Seth Godin. And she was ramping up a coaching engagement for a cohort of Black, Latinx, and Native American rising leaders in corporate America. And she loved all of them for different reasons, but she remembered that during the first month of pregnancy, it was the hardest month ever. And she was still juggling these three different work streams and said, why doesn't anyone tell you about that bionic fatigue that basically makes you useless after 5 p.m.? She couldn't catch any slack because she wasn't sharing yet that she was pregnant, something she has a lot of thoughts about. And so by the end of the month, she had this decision to make. What was the priority? what was she going to choose? She knew she had to let go of something. And it was one of the hardest decisions she'd ever made, but also one of the best one. She works with clients all about this area of the fear of letting go of an awesome opportunity. Because of that, like, what if I'm going to get it back? Will this be okay moment that you have? But ultimately, how saying yes to something that's really important often requires saying no to something else. Today, we are going to talk to Michelle about decision-making, coaching, how motherhood transformed her, and dealing with uncertainty, which is basically a lot of what motherhood and entrepreneurship is all about. Welcome to the Startup Pregnant Podcast, where we talk to creative leaders about what it means to be an entrepreneur and a parent. I'm your host, Sarah K. Peck so many charities to give money to. Today's episode is brought to you by Hippo Give, which is a new and simpler way to support the organizations and causes that you care about. I just made a donation to Planned Parenthood. It took about five seconds. Go to startuppregnant.com slash charity, and you can learn more about how Hippo Give is currently matching all of your first-time donations up to the first $50. So if you want to donate money, go to startuppregnant.com slash charity. It's super easy. There are instructions for how to do it. And there's a free $50 to donate to any charity of your choice. All right, everyone. I have Michelle Florendo on the line. I am so excited. Welcome, Michelle. Thanks, Sarah. Great to be here. I am so glad to have you on the podcast. As you know, as our listeners know, this is a show about both work and career as well as parenting journeys. So with you, I want to start with you on the career side. Can you tell us a little bit about your current work and puzzles and what you're working on? And also tell us about the journey that got you here too. Yeah. So I guess professionally right now, I work as a professional career coach and I I do that in a couple of different ways. It's interesting, like the fact that I I've taken a portfolio approach to my career is not something that I thought would have been possible if you had asked me 15 years ago. And so my portfolio of work right now looks like running my own private practice where I work with mid-career professionals. Often they call me a coach for type A professionals. So working with people who have usually achieved a certain level of success in their careers, but find themselves wondering if this is it or questioning whether that's really what they want to continue doing for the rest of their career because it may not be as fulfilling as they want it to be, which is interesting because, you know, like success and fulfillment, not actually the same thing. And so that's what I do on my private practice side. And then I also spend a significant amount of my time working for a nonprofit organization that provides professional development coaching to Black, Latinx, 
and Native American professionals who are on the road to senior leadership. And so it's a blessing to be able to do this work and really help people examine, you know, how do they make good decisions about their career and life? Because let's be honest, there is no, you know, big inseparable line between our work and our lives. And that's pretty much the work that I do today. But I would say that I don't think I ever would have imagined myself doing this work if you had asked me, like I said, 15 years ago while I was still in college trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And so the arc of my career has taken me through a number of different things. I started out being trained as an engineer, studied decision engineering at Stanford, and from there worked in management consulting, brand management, went to UC Berkeley to get my MBA, did a bit of management work in the nonprofit realm before going out and starting my business as a career coach. I find this so fascinating, and I have so many different questions about this. And I want to talk to you later about decision making. I, I want to ask you a lot of questions about decision making. But first, you have a background in engineering, and you have an MBA, and you've done so much work. How did you get into coaching? Tell us about how you stumbled into it and what called you to it and how this became your career path. Yeah, it's funny because I've reflected on this as well. Like, how did I end up here? And one of the things that I've realized is that I'm very much a maximizer. I don't know if you've ever taken the strengths finder assessment. And one of my core strengths is maximizing. So I love maximization, optimization. That's part of the reason why I ended up studying engineering. And while I was able to use that skill set in the corporate environment uh, for the first part of my career, one of the things that I realized as I was getting my MBA is that there's huge potential to use that skill set in the social impact world. And so initially, I shifted from using my maximization, optimization skill set for solving business problems to solving you know, resource constraint and optimization problems in the nonprofit world. And then I also realized that I could apply that to working individually with people. And I find that when working with leaders and individuals who are you know, out doing really great work and making a difference, being able to help them like maximize their potential creates a multiplier effect in enabling them to maximize their contribution to the work they're doing, which then, you know, has an impact on, you know, the impact their organization is having. And so it was a really powerful realization to see that working individually with people could have such a great impact. But also like another shortcut to like, how did I end up even exploring coaching as a profession uh, dates back to a conversation I had with one of my mentors literally two weeks before I was graduating with my MBA. And we were talking about, you know, what what I was going to do after graduation. And I said, you know, I want to go into public education, but they don't even know what their budgets are. So I'm prepared for an extended search, I'm talking about the types of positions I was looking at. And then we were talking about reflections on, you know, what I learned about myself during business school. And she she was actually the first one who had trained me as a communications leadership coach. And I talked about how I really enjoyed working one-on-one -on -one with people. And then she said, well, that's great. And I see that too. And that sounds nothing like, you know, these jobs that you're trying to recruit for. Mm, interesting. And it's just so funny how sometimes we need, you know, that outside perspective to be able to shine a light on insights and things that may be right underneath our nose. So how long have you been in the field of coaching and what does your business practice look like today? Yeah, so I've been coaching for the past eight years. I was doing a little bit of parallel pathing when I was working in the nonprofit world, but I've been running my own practice for the past five, almost six years. And what it looks like today is it, where I've really focused in on is, you know, helping people make good decisions around their their career and life. So like I said, in my private practice, I work with mid-career professionals who are basically like at a crossroads. Like, you know, they've done this thing for who knows how many years. It seems great, but something's missing. And what's interesting about that work is sometimes we uncover that, you know, the the way that they were making decisions before may have worked for them. 
but the reason why they're feeling the antsiness or feeling like something may not be quite right or quite a great fit is because the way they need to make decisions now or in the future is shifting. So this is so interesting because there's this, I want to go kind of zoom out a little bit and Mm -hmm. then zoom in and going way out. I think one question for a lot of our listeners, there's so much variety in the understanding of what coaching even is, right? Mm. So for people Mm -hmm. who have never heard about coaching on one side of the spectrum to people who feel like coaches are everywhere. How do you explain what that is as a profession? Because that's new. And I'm sure that's something you run into in your field of work. So Mm -hmm. how would you explain it first to somebody that's never heard of this profession before? Yeah, well, at least for the the people I work with, and people I work with tend to have a background in the corporate sector. A lot of them are either in professional services or have worked as consultants. I start there with a base of understanding, right? Right. And so when you bring in a consultant to help you with your work, sometimes they'll play the role of like doing the work. That's not what coaches do. Coaches are not going to live your life for you. Sometimes consultants may come in with a very specific area of expertise and will tell you what to do. That's also not what coaches do. But sometimes consultants will come in and they may not be necessarily the expert in like what you do as a company. But they will be that outside perspective to ask probing questions in the areas that need to be examined and will play things back and help guide you towards, you know, what are the decisions or the action plans that you need to make in order to achieve the change that you're looking for. And so that's the piece that and I feel like that's also the piece that I'd carried from my consulting work into my coaching work. The ability to ask questions so that I can dig into the, like, okay, I'm using air quotes, data Mm. of your everyday, like, life, career, objectives, priorities. Organize that in a way that's much more easier, much more easy to digest. Because, you know, sometimes when people are facing decisions, there's just a lot going on in our heads. Thoughts are flying, emotions are flying, feelings are flying, external Uh, influences are flying around. And part of at least what I do as a coach in my work is pull that together in a way that people can digest, present it to them in a way that, you know, helps them understand, okay, well, what are the things that I do want to prioritize? And what does that mean for the plan of action or the decisions we have going forward? That makes a lot of sense. Okay, then my other question and and this is also related to the field of coaching. What about people who I feel like, and to correct me if I'm wrong, or maybe you're experiencing this as well, but I feel like sometimes you can go out there and on the internet, everybody's a coach nowadays. There's a coach for every area of your life. And this is probably my experience because I run into this all the time and it's so part and parcel with the work that I do. But mm-hmm. there's a coach for your food and your gut flora and for this and for that and for this and for that. And how do you personally distinguish yourself or set yourself apart in the field? Mm. I feel like I, I answer this question more from what I hear from my clients and people I've worked with as opposed to like me coming out with something. Because you know, sometimes that's just how things happen. Like you learn what is it that people see as valuable in what you offer. And what I've heard is that in my work as a coach slash consultant, I think my clients tend to interchange the two. They value one, the outside perspective, two, the accountability for you know staying true to what it is that they really want, especially around when it comes to decision making, there can be a lot of wavering depending on what external influences exist. And so I'm here as someone who's not your spouse, not like anyone who has any skin in the game aside from ensuring that you are happy and doing like what it would take to get you there to be able to digest information, present things back. And also, I think for for me, people find a lot of comfort in the fact that like I've done this work with so many people who, what they usually say, with people like them, like people who tend to be like really driven type A, like had done, uh, air quotes, all the right things to Mm -hmm. get to where they are, but somehow find that it's not quite working for them Mm. and have been able to help others like them out of that and into a life or career that works. Mm. Okay. So 
let's dive into this field that you know of decision making. Can you talk about Mm -hmm. why decision making is so challenging? And then how do you help people make decisions? And how do you know when you've made a good decision? Yeah. So decisions, what I find over and over again, and I feel like this has become my own mini personal mission because when I face decisions, I'm like, oh, goody. Yes. Let's dig into this. Let's analyze this. But when I find other people facing decisions, it's usually with this sense of dread. And that sense of dread usually comes with, you know, like fear, uncertainty, doubt. Like I've seen people who feel like they made bad decisions in the past, so they doubt their ability to make good decisions in the future. I encounter people who just fear the process of decision making. And it's not usually the decision, it's just the fear of uncertainty on the other side and how things might come out. And then I also have people who fear regretting the decision that they have yet to make. And so there's a lot of, I feel like a lot of feelings around decision making that makes it hard for people. I think also another reason why decision making seems to be so challenging is that it's not as if there was like a how to make great decisions course in elementary school or middle school or high school, although I wish maybe in the future there will be. And so like uh, people have been told, you know, just follow your heart or trust your gut, which, you know, for some people who have like really developed and honed their intuition or their objectives may be fine advice. But for most people, that advice seems insufficient Hmm. um, in terms of like how to how to even process or approach a decision. And so I think the other piece there, aside from all the feelings around decision making, is that people don't feel like they have the tools to be able to think through a decision to get to a point of clarity. I think that's so important. And it's one of those things when you look at formal education, which as parents, we start to look at the education system more closely. I think many of us do. And you're Mm -hmm. like, wait, what are we not teaching? Like, what about public speaking skills? And what about art? And what about decision making and these skills of decision making, I think you hit the nail on the head there. And it's something we actually had another guest on the show, Steph Jala. I really asked her a lot of questions about what is intuition. And she finally, we came up with this clearer definition of like internal listening, being able to actually hear yourself and observe yourself over time and start to, as you kind of suggest, collect data about Mm -hmm. yourself and your processes. And it helped so much because I think that like trust your intuition is is not helpful for people who don't know how to do it yet or haven't learned right. or haven't practiced. Yeah. And it's interesting because sometimes people will ask me, well, you know, well, you know, if as a decision engineer, what would you say is the role of intuition in decision making? And I think you just said it. It's another data point. Like even after I walk clients through understanding what are their objectives and what really are the options on the table, what information do they have, we'll do a gut check. And if something in their gut starts sounding the alarm, that usually means that we have missed something in the process. And so it's a useful thing to tap into still. How have you studied and learned about decision making? Are there formal classes that you went through in your adult life and books that you recommend? Yeah. So I, like I said, I had started out, I guess, my my journey in this field as an undergraduate uh, at Stanford. In my major, I specialized in decision engineering. And so there is a field called decision analysis that walks you through essentially the, the processes and like how to approach traditionally business decisions with rigor. And so I did take an entire battery of coursework around, you know, how to approach decisions and how do you evaluate the value of information and how do you deal with uncertainty and how do you quantify outcomes. Now, that's the piece that that I've had to learn how to apply differently in personal decision making because we can't always quantify outcomes in terms of like money or utility when it comes to personal decisions. But that is where I started. And you know, I went into consulting, used that knowledge base to help companies make the best decisions for them. But I did notice that you know, there were some fundamental principles of decision analysis that can help people make people and personal decisions in a better way. And so 
I mean, for those people who have time, there is a really great book out there called Smart Choices. It's written by a couple professors from Harvard that that tries to lay out some of how you can use some of these principles of decision analysis in everyday life, whether it's, you know, like whether I should buy a house or whether I should like take this job or whether I should, I don't think they address the whether I should marry this person, (laughs) but it's surprising like how you can still apply some things to even like those types of deeply personal questions. Oh, that's fascinating. (laughs) But also a lot of this work has been through just like doing my own exploration and and study of how is it that we can apply these principles to personal decision making, especially yeah. in, you know, like the work that I've done with people in my coaching practice over you, time. You mentioned as one example, people getting stalled and stuck rather than seeing something as a data point or something to be mm. added to the like the analysis toolkit. What kinds of things do you see people consistently doing poorly in everyday decision making? Like with this breadth of knowledge that you have when you look around at folks. Do you see any patterns like, oh, I wish people would not do this or I wish they would do more <sighs> of this? Yes. I think the first, or probably the number one thing that I see people conflate or get wrong about decision making is what defines the quality of a decision. And so I'll give an example. A lot of times people experience regret around a decision they made because, you know, they made a decision at some point in time and then things did not turn out the way that they wanted them to. And so they'll look back and say, oh, I made a bad decision. Now, the thing is, decisions are about what you can control. Decisions are not about what you can't control. Like, it's not like you can decide for it to rain tomorrow, right? Or it's not like you can decide for some uncertainty, any uncertainty to play out the way that it does. What you can decide is, you know, how do you act or how do you respond and what do you do in a situation? And so if there's one thing that I love to teach people, it's that the decision quality or the quality of a decision is separate and distinct from the quality of the outcome. And I feel like this is something that we should even be teaching our children. Because I remember I was playing, I think, a card game with my niece one day. And you know, she had to make a decision around, you know, whether she was going to like put down one card versus another. And, you know, it was a hard decision for her because she wasn't sure what was the next card going to be in the deck. And that would have an um, impact on whether, you know, she would have more points or less points. And I could just see on her little face, she was like eight, like just her face was twisting up and I could see she was just stressing out about like this card game. And I had to just step in and say, you know, just make the best decision with the information you have and move forward. Like you can't control like what is going to be that next card in the deck, but you can just focus on, you know, what is the piece you can control and not beat yourself up over the piece that you can't control. Oh, that's so smart it, because there's so many times when you make a decision And you forget to put yourself back in that experience. Like with Mm -hmm. hindsight, it's easy to say, oh, well, like knowing what I know now, I wouldn't have made that decision. But we didn't have that information back then. Yeah. Hmm. I love that. And that also that prompts you to to almost get better at making decisions faster. It's like, okay, here's Mm -hmm. the information I have. Make a decision. Can't control the other stuff. Like, Right. That's so smart. And that that happens like on my side, that happens all the time when I'm writing. I can only control what I send. I cannot control what people write back. Like I just, right. I, I, I wish I could. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like <laughs> that would be, that would certainly be a magic tool. So I want to shift over to asking you about how your parenting journey interweaves and intersects with all of this. Can you talk about your parenting journey? It's interesting. I feel like my parenting journey started back when I was evaluating whether or not to start my business. I I feel like starting a business is usually seen as a a risky thing, right? Like entrepreneurs take risks, like those type of people who start businesses. And I would not say I'm one of those people. I am not a risk taker. I am very much a risk averse person. It's probably also a function of like why I really enjoyed my training in decision engineering. It's like, oh, I could like actually quantify these risks and calculate them. But I am willing to make calculated risks if it means 
better options in being able to get what I want in the end. And so back when I was deciding whether to start a business, it wasn't even like a thing I was thinking about until I realized, you know, if there's something I do know, I know that I want to become a mom. And I also know that I want to be able to see my kids when they are young. And I saw so many of my colleagues in the for-profit and nonprofit world when they had their first child, like feeling like they had to make this really incredibly difficult decision about whether they were going to go to, back to work to a career that they loved, but have to you know, leave their kid at home and only see them maybe for an hour before they went to sleep just due to commute times and length of the workday. Or they would choose to stay at home with their kid and have to give up this career that they loved. And I was not satisfied with those two options. And if there's anything that I had learned from like decision engineering, it's that it's worth it to explore what other options exist beyond the obvious. And so for me, the decision to you know go out on a limb, try out this like, let's see if I can you know start my own business and be able to do work on my own terms and be able to create a work environment where I could have more control and flexibility over my schedule and my work and where I worked was all a function of me trying to broaden my options. Hmm. And so I did that ahead of time, again, because I'm like a risk averse person and I wanted like a certain like runway to be able to test that out and see if that would work before I actually had kids. Mm -hmm. And again, like it was a very calculated risk, but for me, I felt like the bigger risk would have been to do nothing and not have a way that I could like have the life and career life that I wanted. Mm. And so then you did go forward and launch this business, but then how mm. did you decide when to start trying for kids? That was actually really a, a recognition of, you know, again, what can I control and what can I not control? <laughs> And I feel like part of this parenting journey has been like over and over again, learning and reminding myself about, you know, what is it that I can't control? I can control when I decide to start trying. I cannot control when it actually happens. And so for me, it was really interesting because this was back in 2015. And, you know, I feel like you hear a lot of, you know, you'll never be ready. You'll never be fully ready. And I was like, okay, well, let me just start trying. But I'm also going to go like full force, like all all engines fired up on my career side too. And then, you know, when things happen, I'll have a new opportunity to make a decision. And so 2015, we started trying to, you know, have our first child. And at the time I was still working on my business, still had a full client load there. And then out of the blue this like really amazing opportunity with the nonprofit organization I work for now came up. And then also this opportunity to be on the inaugural coaching staff for Seth Godin's All MBA also came up. And I said yes to all three. Wow. And <laughs> well, because like at the time, at least earlier in the year, I wasn't pregnant yet. And, you know, I I was going to find a way to make it work because they were all really fascinating opportunities. I had at the very least wanted to like see how things could play out. And also, like I fully believe in this like portfolio model for work because it allows for a lot more flexibility if you can swing it than just being tied to one thing. At least for me, that's mm -hmm. how it worked out. Mm -hmm. Well, like later in the year, the piece that I couldn't control like happened and I found myself pregnant right in the midst of, you know, still maintaining a client load of 10 to 15 clients on my private practice, ramping up work with a new cohort of fellows for the nonprofit, and then coaching coaches in the second session of the Alt-MBA. And, and that's when I realized, like, I had an opportunity to make a new decision. Because one thing I didn't anticipate was, you know, that incredible fatigue in the first trimester. I was like, why did no one tell me about this? I was prepared <laughs> For, you know, the, the morning sickness and you know, the queasiness. And actually, I didn't experience any of that. It was the fatigue that kicked my butt. At it's that point so time, real. Like, it's yeah. so <laughs> real. People have no idea. And I'm like, 
I could sleep for like 12 hours and take a nap. And it's not like a, oh, great, I'm sleeping in on the weekend. It's like you can't move or get out of bed because you're in a thick, swampy soup of tired. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like I remember just at 5 p.m. like needing to lie down on the couch and it wasn't like I was totally asleep either. It was just this fog of my brain was mush. I couldn't move. Like I'd have to ask my husband, can you get me a glass of water? (laughs) Like, yeah, it was real. Yeah. Um, Yeah. A a friend of mine just texted me and she was, she, she's five weeks pregnant. So she hasn't told anyone yet or that many people yet. And she texted me a photo of her like lying on the bathroom floor while she's giving a bath to her first child. And she's like, (laughs) I periodically get up and make sure he's still alive, but I'm just so (laughs) tired. And I was like, yes, that's right. (laughs) Oh, and and you touched on something like I think the most challenging part of that period of time was that I felt like I couldn't tell anyone what was going on and what was happening in my body because you know in this society like there are all sorts of reasons why like people don't talk about pregnancy in the first trimester until it's well anyways I have a lot to say on that later or on a different conversation but yeah so so I had these like three different things going on and. You know, I was doing my best to power through it, but also coming to terms with the limits of my body and my ability. And and I realized, okay, well, this is an opportunity to to choose. Like, how do I want to move forward through this? And what are my highest priorities? And like as as exciting as it would have been to be able to continue like doing all of those different things. What was the highest priority for me was to be able to be present in my pregnancy. And I say to be present because initially I was about to say uh, to enjoy, but I also realized, yeah, I was not going to know what was going to happen over the next like six months for the remaining of my pregnancy. And especially given how blindsided I was by the whole fatigue thing, I wanted to not tuck pregnancy away as like, oh, yeah, this thing on the side that my body's doing while I'm doing all this other stuff but really be able to be present for it and tune into it and listen to what my body needed. And, you know, it, for the the nice, blissful moments of it, be able to revel in that if and when those moments came. <laughs> so how did you handle all of this? And and you said you had a new decision. What What changed and how did it keep changing throughout the pregnancy? Yeah, well, like the decision was, you know, how did I want to spend my time? And again, I wanted to be able to make space for myself to be present with my body. And for me, what that meant was being able to say no to something. So being able to say yes to myself required saying no to something. And of all the different opportunities I had on my slate, it was really hard and it made me really sad for a moment. But then I realized like why I was making the decision. And I said no to staying involved with the alt MBA. It makes so much sense. And it can yet still be so painful to have to make those yeah. decisions. But I love how you reframed that too. I said, well, I remembered why I was doing it because I was saying yes to this other thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it wasn't like I was losing something. Like this was me exercising my agency in the situation. Mm. Wow. So take us forward. How is the rest of pregnancy for you? And tell us about your kid. So the rest of pregnancy, I feel like was fairly uneventful. I mean, I wouldn't say uneventful. It was like, I'm very thankful that I got to experience like moments of bliss. Like there were definitely times where I had the space to just take a moment and be in awe of like what was happening inside of my body. And then also taking moments to question what was happening to the outside of my body because I had this really weird like itching condition. I don't know if you've heard of pups, Hmm. not pups like puppies, but like it's like P-U-P-P-P-S. It's basically like this really severe itching that usually has an onset maybe in the last four to six weeks of pregnancy. But somehow I had it starting at week 22, which like baffled my midwives. This is the type of itching that can be so severe that women will choose to be induced for labor because the only way you can stop it is to birth your baby. Oh, yeah. (laughs) That sounds terrible. (laughs) So that was interesting. Again, and I think it was just like another lesson of, I think it paved the way for reminding me 
that, you know, there are things that I cannot control. And what I can control is like, you know, how I respond to the situation. How do you and deal with something like that? Exploring the interwebs and what, you know, remedies people have. <laughs> yep, <laughs> yep. So there's like bathing with tar soap and, you know, just having a consistent supply of ice packs to like put on myself and kind of like numb the itching. That's that's actually the the path that worked best for me. And then also for me, sometimes, you know how if you're just like sitting around and not doing anything, like an itch can really be crazy making. But if you distract yourself with something else, like it's not as severe. I did a little bit of that. So it's a little bit of like everything, you know, evaluating, okay, like what options are out there? What can I try? How can I make this work? And also remembering like this is temporary. I think that's also like an important thing. Like our bodies do such crazy things over the course of pregnancy and sometimes does things that's just like, oh, I just wish this would stop. But it will. Yeah. It will eventually. Yeah. And I think remembering that was was also helpful. Mm. Pregnancy is so weird. Yeah. It's like <laughs> so it is so strange sometimes. You're just like, what is happening? So you mentioned, um, I don't want to skip past this, but you mentioned that you, you were like, I have a lot of thoughts about this silence in the first trimester. What do you wish were different? Like, what is it that you would you say or do differently? Or, or how would you, what do you wish we females in our society did differently in this regard? I mean, to be completely honest, like, I, I think that we should talk about pregnancy and being pregnant and what's happening in our bodies, like from the point at which it starts. You know, and thinking about it, I think that there's a lot of silence around, or there's a lot of hesitation to share news about pregnancy until you, like, air quotes, know the pregnancy is viable, like, whenever that happens after the first trimester, or, like, after that, like, 22-week checkup, whatever. But what that stems from is, you know, this fear of sharing news with people and then having to share news that the pregnancy ended, mm -hmm. right? And, like, I'm very being very intentional with my language because I've also noticed that you know, there's a lot of language out there about, oh, I lost the baby, which is like, when you hear those words, that's like, it produces like a very different feeling from the pregnancy was not viable. Right. Right. Or there's, there's a lot of language out there. I lost the baby. Like, oh, it's our fault. And again, a lot of my work around decision making is around identifying like what is within our control and what is not. And miscarriage and like ending of pregnancies, like often isn't with especially miscarriage is not within our control and it's actually a very natural thing it's a very natural and important thing that our bodies do when it notices like something may not be quite right or the baby would not survive hmm. out of the womb or to term and right. so like our body does its thing and taps in its into its own inner wisdom and or it's dangerous for the woman exactly. or the baby won't live and you have to make a decision that seems so terrible. And But then there's all that judgment. People, oh, God, don't get me started yeah. as well. Right? Right. Oh. Again, there's a lot of things. There are a lot of things that are outside of our control. And the best that we can do is focus on the things that we can hmm. and make decisions that align with like what it is that we we want or what it is that is best in the end. Yeah, and I feel like a lot of the silence is around taking fault or burdening ourselves mm -hmm. with the parts we can't control. Oh my God, this is brilliant. You're like, you're making me think of so many things like the language. Do we personalize it? Do we say I, we, me? You know, who do we, is it outside of our control inside of our, this is brilliant, Michelle. This is so helpful. But, um, and that's the thing, like I'm all about intentional decision making that taps into even the stories and the language that we use ourselves. Hmm. And like, this has become so, so clear to me, especially in light of like recent health things that have been happening with me. And um, well, I might as well share it because I, I found that like the people that I share this with, like, get it then. Hmm. And so, you know, sometimes Sometimes there's nothing that we can control except for, you know, what we do in the situation and the language we use or the stories we tell ourselves, we choose to tell ourselves. And that is kind of where emotions come from. Emotions come from the stories we tell ourselves about what's happening to us or in the world. And so 
like like I said, this has become really clear to me given something that happened a few months ago. And so I had to check into the ER because I had some issues breathing. Like my throat felt like it was closing up. I wasn't sure what was happening. It was a new sensation. I got on a call with an advice nurse and based on how I sounded, she's like, you need to go to the ER. So I'm like, okay, let me go to the ER. And they treated me. They gave me, you know, like medication. And I got to a point where I, you know, felt better. I could breathe. And so I was ready, like, okay, all right, I'm better. Let's you know, how long until I can check out and, you know, get back to my kid. And they're like, oh, you know, let's just like take an x-ray of your throat and make sure that everything's fine. So they did that. And the doctor comes back in the room and he says, I want to show you something. And he pulls up my x-ray on his phone. And he says, you see that there? Like there's something that's narrowing your windpipe. There's like a, a mass there and we don't know what it is, but it's not supposed to be there. Whoa. And in that moment, like I could feel, you know, like a wave of like fear and like, what do you mean? Like usually when you hear those words, like it can be a really scary thing. And, and in the hours and weeks and months since one thing that I've carried with myself is that in every moment we can choose the narrative that we have around what's happening. And so the initial story that came up was like mass growth. I need a biopsy. This like, what if I have cancer? What's that? What if I have like limited time? Like all of that. But that was just one option. Like another option could have been, okay, there's something there. They don't know what it is. I don't actually have enough information right now to decide anything, right? I don't have enough information that would like change anything that I do until I have more information. And so why not just keep going on with my life until I have information that'll change decisions that I make in the future? And that's a choice. Like I could choose that narrative if I wanted. I went a step further and also realized, you know, okay, yeah, those those are two different options for narratives. But what would if what would I look like if I, you know, faced that fear and examined what it was, which can also be a really empowering thing. Sometimes we'll feel fear and we'll we'll just kind of like let it hang out in the background, kind of like, you know, the the things that go bump in the night. But if we like look at what it really is, it's a step towards disarming it. And so it's like, okay, well, what is this fear that's coming up? Oh, it's this intense fear that the amount of time I have left is limited. And so I went a step further and said, well, you know, what could be useful about that. And I realized, you know, this could be an opportunity for me to examine, you know, if I have limited time left, and let's be real, we all have limited time on this earth. Am I spending my time in the way that I want? And and it's not as if I chose any one of those narratives and just stuck with it, like over the the weeks afterwards. But in each moment, I recognize I had a choice. We always have a choice. And in some of the moments, it's like, yes, I am going to let myself feel that fear. And I'm going to speak it to you know people in my support network and feel held by them. And then other days, I was like, you know what? I don't actually have information that can change the decisions that I make until I get new information. So let me just go about daily life. And then there are also moments where I was like, you know what? Let me use this as a point of reflection. And am I spending my time the way that I want to? Oh, that's the point such is, a we wise always, question. always have a choice. Yeah, it's so wise. So, are you are you currently in limbo or in that space of still waiting to collect more information? Yes, it's funny. Like I was expecting, okay, at some point in time, I would get resolution and I would know, and then I would know how to move forward. And of course, you know, life life gives us sometimes what we don't expect. Mm-hmm. And so, I don't have cancer, which I am very thankful for. But the condition that I do have still has a lot of uncertainty around it. Basically, like, I'm not going to give the medical name because the medical name pretty much translates into like, oh, yeah, your throat is narrowing and we have no idea why. That's a lot of medical names, right? It's like, (laughs) this is happening. All we have is a name for it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And so I'm still like, again, like I have those three choices still, really. and. And it's been such a gift, actually, to be able to learn how to deal with uncertainty. 
and again, like made me really laser focused on, you know, what is without, what is outside of my control? What is within my control? And what choices can I make? Mm -hmm. Then at the root, each of these instances that you've shared throughout this whole podcast episode have also been about how does this new information or this new decision bring me back to what do I actually want? Like what's, right. what's underneath all of this? Is this important? What do I actually want? Mm -hmm. Michelle, we're going to have to have you back for another episode of the podcast because there's a thousand more questions I want to ask you. But today, I think this inquiry into decision making and understanding what's within our control and what's outside of our control, it's so relevant across parenting, across pregnancy and across our work and our choices, not just in our careers, but in our lives. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for taking the time and for sharing all of this with everyone. And also best of luck to your health journey. I know how those go. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks for having me. Like I yeah. love talking about this. Oh, it's so great. Now also tell us before we turn off the recording, where can people find you? Where do you live on the internet? Yeah, so they can find me at michelleflorendo.com. That's my site where I talk about decision making and like all that stuff. Uh, there's also a link from that site to my coaching practice if people are interested in that. But I'd say michelleflorendo.com is a good place to start. Thank you so much for being a listener of the show. A few more things before we end this episode. First, if you know of a woman or a friend that would benefit from this show, send them a link to our website at startuppregnant.com. So many of you have already reached out and shared your stories, what this podcast is doing for you. And for that, I am so grateful. So if you know of somebody that would love to listen in, or you think that these stories would really hit at home for somebody, feel free to send it along. Second, if you've got a story that you need to share or tell, head over to startuppregnant.com and send us a note. We have had so much reader mail already, and your stories mean the world to us. We are proudly listener-sponsored, so if you want to sponsor the show and hear more episodes, head over to our Patreon page, and you can buy us a cup of coffee, or two, or three. We'll take many cups of coffee. If you want any of the show notes or links from this particular episode, all of the references and tools and tips that we talk about are always posted on startuppregnant.com. Thanks so much for listening, and I will see you on the next episode.